There's one group, Origen, early fathers of the church, looked upon the Greek philosophy as a source to be used to interpret the scriptures. There's another group, of course, that were hostile to it. But I mean, in particular... Clement is another one. Uh, Socrates is talking about really being what we coming from a biblical background sounds very much like a prophet. Uh, oh, there was the belief in a, you know, a double, double revelation by reason and by faith. And the very point that you're coming to is one which many people held which was the Greeks had a rational way of revelation, what they called partial revelation, oh, oh, maybe. and, and, and uh, parallel I'm to it. Stop, but I'm talking about no, no, not our uh, Socrates that's having voices speak to him. Uh, that's not uh, rational. Oh, rational in that everyday sense, but it is still intelligible, yeah. Well, a person can have a feeling of commitment. You don't have to have a voice telling you. Mm -hmm. You have a feeling that you have a commitment to the truth. If you want to find the truth for what it is, you have a commitment to do that. You don't have oh. to have somebody's oh. voice tell you to do it. Huh. So that now if we're going to run a class on philosophy in respect to the, so the Socratic vision, would you agree you would have to establish it as part of a spiritual tradition? And you'd have to then pull in all of these things about his role and his respect for the gods and the way in which he perceives the gods relating to him. You'd have to then stress the fact that he was influenced by what he thought was divine presence and influence in a variety of ways, all the ways in which any man can ever be influenced. And therefore, would you not agree that if you're going to say that is philosophy, and if you want to get into it, how could you get into it? Take 30 units? It's a different realm. It's the realm of the spirit. And this is, of course, what Socrates brought us, Plato brought us, and it started the greatest, great philosophical, spiritual tradition called the Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition. Yeah. And well, this numbers, was... A number of uh, people in the Catholic Church that followed Plato. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was, it was almost predominantly Platonic until later on it turned yeah. Aristotelian. Well, even Aristotelian in those days had a Neoplatonic yeah. uh, aspect to it, very profound. But they turned against it when they discovered that the roots of their so-called Christian thought was in fact pagan and introduced by Pseudo-Dionysius and people like that. So that caused the split. That caused the major split. Well, uh, that's why I posed the question about Socrates. Uh. Yeah, but you see, the difficulty with Socrates as a spiritual figure is that where is the role for faith? There isn't. It's a belief, perhaps, but it isn't a saving belief. It's the role of perfection, perfecting your soul, perfecting um. your understanding. Right? Perfecting the soul through truth and understanding. If I remember correctly, the, the early church fathers who basically were going to school him, uh, uh, Greek philosophical thought, is that uh, reaching that place when to them it seemed like all the philosophers were contradicting each other and uh, therefore being very impressed with the Bible that, that, uh, that there did seem to be a common theme with the prophets as opposed to the philosophers who seem to contradict each other. Yeah, see, we use the word philosophers to include what really should be called, see, if we were to use the language purely, I think we'd make a distinction and say there's a love of wisdom, <clears throat> meaning by wisdom the, the uh, very nature of the divine <clears throat> uh, in its most profound aspect penetrating the human dimension. But there's also a love of opinions. And there are many opinions that people have such as it's impossible to ever have a penetrating insight into wisdom, it's impossible really to know 
the nature of the divine, and therefore they construct other systems of thought based upon that opinion. So there's really two classes of thinkers. There's philosophers, philosophias, that's wisdom, and there's the philodoxia. Now most philosophers today are philodoxias. They, they love collecting, distinguishing, and arguing different opinions. They have nothing to do with the spiritual dimension of philosophy. They don't meditate, they don't, con you know, they don't go into religious retreats, they don't try to cultivate the spirit, they're not involved in any uh, purification of such a nature that would bring about a reversion, a turnabout of their soul into some my, more divine element. That, that's not philosophy. Well, if you go to most, uh, when I was studying philosophy, <clears throat> the philosophers would, would uh, put down every other philosopher, same thing in psychology, they put down all the other schools of thought. No make themselves look good. They do the same thing in religion. Mm -hmm. You go to a to ministry, he puts no. out all the other religions to show that he's the only one that uh, has a true religion. And That's right. Try to but you can take this tradition and you can line in that tradition the whole Neoplatonic tradition. You don't find disagreements in this tradition. There may be differences because they're trying to express something in the nature of the intelligible, but they don't, they don't argue against one another. Plotinus doesn't, Proclus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Ceranicus, Numius. Well, philosophy got a Numinous. bad reputation because there's so many people just arguing for the sake of argument. Yeah, in one of the, one of the great dialogues, the Phaedo, uh, Socrates mentions the fact that philosophy has a, a good name. That's a good name. He says, Therefore, a lot of people want to wear the cloak. Yeah. And they shouldn't pick it up, they should leave it alone. But he calls himself, see, Socrates calls himself uh, in the Phaedo a mystic. That's what he is. He calls himself a mystic. Oh, yeah. Here, let me give you the quote. As a matter of fact, this is a rather, uh, <laughs> it's rather a fun quote. If I use this, I can, I can make a fun well, quote. He's a mystic, then he doesn't need any other. He probably needs to tell him to tell him because he perceives it within himself. Yes. He doesn't need any oracles yeah. or anything yeah. any, uh, now, you must indulge for a moment while I read this because there's a, there's a joke behind this. All right? Fair enough? Here it is. <clears throat> I'm in the Phaedo. He just finished making the point that wisdom itself, wisdom itself is a means of purification. Now, here comes the quote. Indeed, it seems those who established our mystic rites were no fools. They in truth spoke with a hidden meaning long ago when they said that whoever is uninitiated and unconsecrated when he comes to the house of Hades will lie in mud. But the purified and the consecrated when he goes there will dwell with the gods. Indeed, as they say in the rites, many are called, but few are chosen. And these few are, in my opinion, no others than those who have loved wisdom in the right way. Find that an interesting quote? Many are called, but few are chosen? Well, how did it get into Plato 500 years earlier? That's easy. I'll show you why because there's a footnote in very small print and the author, the translator, excuse me, says Plato's text, the Greek means, quote, wand bearers are many but inspired mystics are few. So he substituted a New Testament quote <laughs> Which changes the meaning, changes the meaning of the entire thing. Would you read the last one again? The quote? Yeah, yeah. 